Hello. Hi. Um, Emma Norrie from the Department of Primary Industries in New South Wales. Um, thanks all of you for very interesting presentations. I just had a question for Juanita. Um, are you communicating all of your efforts through the supply chain, I guess, to those that are buying your products and are you having a positive response or even seeing a financial benefit from that? Is that working? Yeah. Um, as Brooke alluded to earlier, we do in cotton, but that's the only commodity. Um, and unfortunately, when you're looking at the grains and cereals market, the oil seeds market, it's a bulk commodity. And one of the things that we are severely frustrated by is the merchants that are part of that process in selling things. Um, so we don't actually have a direct relationship with um, the end buyer or the consumer. And I think that's something that, that is a prime target for disruptive technology in the future. Um, and one of the frustrations I had this year was we grow durum wheat, which is for pasta. And, you know, the Liverpool Plains has got really high quality vitriolic um, grains and it's highly sought after, especially in Italy. And we had around about 17 to 18% protein. And all of our, 100% of our crop went DR1, which is the highest grade you can possibly have. And we did not get a cent of benefit from that extra quality in our, in our product. And we tried to contact people to sell it separately via the container. It's almost impossible. But we know that the merchants buy that. And then it's the lowest common denominator. Um, our products then used to up uplift somebody else's or they then just go and sell it as a premium product and get all of the margin. So yeah, no, I don't get paid for what I do <laughs> in every commodity. Um, we are seeing some great um, improvements in the cotton industry, but that is the exception to the rule. Um, so anyone that, I, I mean, I'm constantly sitting there thinking what disruptive technology, what Uber technology can I find for me to sell my commodities? I want it, I want it yesterday. Thanks. There's a question right up the back. If um, questioners could introduce themselves, that would uh, help everyone, I think. I'll do that. Richard Dickman, Bayer Crop Science. So, Juanita again. Uh, the uh, cotton, you know, your ability to add value, uh, extract additional value uh, in cotton is really linked to the BMP and all of that uh, uh, associated with that. I mean, how do you feel about, uh, you know, doing that for other crops as well? I mean, is it incredibly onerous? I mean, if you had to do it for your, for your wheat and, and so on, or is that something that really needs to be taken on by farmers if they want to extract the extra value? It's not an onerous job because um, the practices that you're doing apply, doesn't matter what crop you're growing, you're utilising um, the soil to grow something. And your farming practices don't change based on the seed that you put in the ground. So whether I put um, sorghum, whether I put corn, whether I put cotton, the best practice management that we're applying to that farm is there regardless. So I think it, um, those sort of uh, acknowledged best farming practices can be um, across different commodities without a doubt. Um, is it onerous? No because it, not only are we getting better results in terms of what we're getting out of our natural assets, we're also getting acknowledgement for the good work that we're doing. Um, the financial reward for us may not be from the end purchaser, but it's definitely coming through in terms of our productivity. So, um, if, yeah, if, if, they, if there were some uh, certified practices that we can apply to our, our wheat or anything like that, we jump at the chance, but at the end of the day, I think the mismatch is they don't see that as something we should be rewarded for. They just see it as something we should be doing regardless. So um, how do you capture that value is, is the age-old, um, I suppose, dilemma. And most consumers just take it as granted that you do that regardless. They're not going to pay you a premium for doing the right thing. So that's the dilemma we have. Yep. Um. While other people think about a question, I've got one to, I think, Julia and probably Juanita. Um, um, Juanita outlined the difference between cotton and the other crops. Um, Julia, through the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative and your people at the processor and, um, and retail end of the, the spectrum, do you see any growth in other um, commodities 
starting to feed back down the supply line that the Kellogg's might want to say, uh, our cornflakes come from uh, maize that's uh, grown on good soil and being well maintained, a little bit like um, cotton. Is it starting to appear through the supply chain? Yeah, look, I, I think in simple terms it is, um, but I would have to agree with Winita that it's, um, that's a given. So, so a company like Kellogg's or, or really any of our processor or manufacturing members, the brand names, if you like, and the Coles and the Woolies, they would like that, that um, assurance, but they're very unlikely to pay any extra for it. So, that, so the key, the key for, for industry and for growers is to be able to do that, to meet those requirements, but, but to do it in a very cost-effective way. Yep. Christian here at the front. Hi there. Pete Bedwell, uh, Primary Media. Uh, one for you, Juliet. Do you think you can sell sustainability? What you've put up there, it strikes me in Europe, uh, this is already happening. There's more concern about sustainability than there is about animal welfare, for instance. So could you, could you say, you know, the sustainable chicken, for instance? Just don't say green chicken because that turns people off. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I, I think Australia is quite different to Europe. I, I, think, um, I think in fairly simple terms that's probably the answer to, to the question. Um, the consumer research that we've done, for example, and, and, and other, other brands have done, suggests that for, for our product anyway, for chicken, sustainability, um, the... It, it's in sort of in that top category of products that consumers are concerned about the sustainability of, but what they're actually concerned about is animal welfare when you drill down. So it's, and then that's really why you, for me anyway, you need to take quite a broad definition of what sustainability is. And I think the individual market will, I guess, nominate what the marker is. You know, so, so for Australians, it seems to be about animal welfare. Um, but the expectation that you're, a good water manager and that you're managing um, environmental impacts through your supply chain, all of those sorts of things, that's an expectation that people take, they take for granted that, that we're all doing. Um, but but I, yeah, I think there are some quite big differences between um, Europe and Australia. And I, I think also it will change. Yeah. Um, question up the back. Hi, Anna Carr from the department. Um, thank you all very much. It's an um, absolute pleasure to hear from you. Um, in the words, I think you might have mentioned them at the beginning, <laughs> Neil, about soils ain't soils. So you can't compare the one soil good in one context from another. And in the same way, you know, sustainability here is different from sustainability in Europe. So where in common do you get your notions of what is good from when it comes to sustainable practices and ideas. Where do you go? Look, uh, I'll throw my two bobs worth in. I think in the soils area, we, we've barely started on, on the, the whole process of certification of, of what is a healthy soil. Um, at the moment, there are proposals uh, internationally for uh, voluntary guidelines on sustainable soil management. Now, look, framing that in a way that would work in Europe and would work for our soils, just that issue alone, before you go to other parts of the world, is incredibly difficult. And it's because of the, the geographic uh, specifics of uh, a particular management practice. Um, that's a starting point, but I further comments? I probably onto that as well. Um, in cotton, a lot of those global standards are being set by the NGOs. <laughs> So NGOs are setting up sustainability metrics programs, individual brands are doing the same, and they're using average yes. numbers um, for all cotton production in the world, which is really concerning to us because we're well above the average in many of the categories they're looking at. So Hugo Boss, for example, has its own calculator. It plugs in a whole lot of numbers when they want to develop a new shirt or suit or whatever, and it'll spit out numbers for what sorts of fabrics should be used in that product. So we're working individually with th those sustainability metrics programs to make sure that the Australian cotton story is, is treated differently um, in those kinds of programs because it's really difficult <laughs> to get an average kind of expectation mm. around what sustainability means for the whole industry. Yeah. Mm. And I, I, I would agree with that for our industry as well, but again, it's something that is evolving and maturing. So if you look at, um, 
for example, some of the data sets that are used when you're doing a life cycle assessment. You, you know, you, you can get a figure for chicken, for example, and it's the same. Mm. It's the average for, for all, you know, for all of the research that's been done across the world. So one way that we, I guess, test or we know what good looks like is through benchmarking, and that's through understanding your own business um, uh, very well, I guess, and, and knowing what your numbers are uh, and knowing what you're comparing um, to. I mean, a, a lot of the international research, it's it really all, it, it, particularly with life cycle assessment, which is a, a very commonly used tool now. It's all to do with the scoping, you know, so how, how far have they gone, how far have you gone? So we've taken the approach that we will measure as much as we possibly can so that we can draw a line around whatever <laughs> they have to do that direct comparison. But benchmarking is one way of, I guess, helping with that, that problem. Okay, um, it's 3.30 and people no doubt have some busy networking to do at afternoon tea. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers, Neil, Juanita, uh, Brooke and Julia. And